Okay, let's get started. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Joan McCabe, Director of Operations, and I've been with the MFA Visual Narrative Program since its auspicious launch in 2012. And I'm honored to have been recently elected Story Godmother, although admittedly running unopposed. A warm welcome to all, and we very much appreciate your time and focus tonight. The MFA Visual Narrative Program is the managing department for the Rizzo Lab and for the storytelling courses offered by our alumni and faculty that you will meet tonight. Rob, do you have the earbuds? Yeah. Okay. Everyone turn off their mics, please. Thank you. The MFA Visual Narrative Program offers a fresh perspective and bold alternative to traditional MFA programs. We do so by recognizing that a command of story is the most powerful and fundamental foundation an artist in any creative profession can possess. Our educational mission is to inspire all students to harness their collective creative writing and visual development talents to amplify their visual narrative skills and master their personal command of story. Our graduates are empowered to be the next generation of transformational relevant original content creators. The MFA and visual narrative program prepares them for leadership with the confidence to own their own personal voice and the visual narrative expertise to change the world through story. We approach this through multidisciplinary study ranging from character development with a theater director to world building with a game designer to the foundation of visual language with experts in children's books, branding, mapping, film, and photography. We welcome students from diverse backgrounds, even those outside standard art training. A bachelor's degree in any subject is accepted. We are low residency. During the three summer intensive semesters at SVA in the heart of New York City, students attend courses supported by a network of industry and market experts. Throughout the four semesters of online study during the fall and spring, students are able to work remotely and travel without having to uproot their professional careers and family or change their personal lifestyles. Our alumni have moved into careers in creative direction, animation, comics, game development, film, toy design, information and motion design, education, and many other disciplines. Recent graduates have worked for such organizations as Apple, Fisher Price, Penguin Books, Disney Plus, Chase, Deloitte Digital, Nickelodeon, MTV2, Exploding Kittens, my favorite, Major League Baseball, Nike, Google, the Boston Globe, and the White House. Others have gone on to successful teaching positions at prestigious institutions such as NYU, Rutgers, Gallaudet, College of Marin, CCS, UConn, CCNY, KCAI, and the School of Visual Arts. I'm here tonight to host this CE presentation, but welcome any inquiries about the full MFA Visual Narrative Program as well. Drop a line in the chat to me and we can arrange to talk in depth after tonight. Applications are currently open to start this summer. We're very proud of our continuing ed offerings, our alumni and faculty, Suzanne and Sarah, our faculty, Bob, and I thank Pan especially for his work bringing the Rizzo Lab to a prominent place in the printing community worldwide. And now Pan Terzis will kick things off. Pan is an artist, printer, and publisher based in New York. His work has been published by Nieves, Fantagraphics, Landfill Editions, Vice Magazine, and others. And he has been exhibited across the US and internationally, including at the Elizabeth Foundation, Printed Matter Inc., the Swiss Institute, the Para Museum in Istanbul, Andreas Melos Presents in Athens, and the Greek Consulate in New York. He's worked with commercial clients, including Bloomberg Digital, American Apparel, Digitaria, Elsewhere Space, iBodega, McDonald's, Lurid Records, and others. Terzis is also the founder of the Rizzo Press, Mega Press. His artist books, zines, and print editions are in the collection of MoMA Library, the Brooklyn Museum, the New York Public Library, and the collection of Stanford University, among others. He teaches printmaking and risograph printing at the School of Visual Arts in New York and is co-founder of the SBA Rizzo Lab. Take it away, Pan. Thank you, Joan. Um, and uh, thank, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, as Joan said, um, uh, I have been, I've had the pleasure of running the SVA Rizzo Lab for the last uh, six years at this point. Um, I'm going to be quickly going through a few of our faculty briefly. I'll be reading their bios uh, before they all, each of them present. But 
Tonight joining us, we've got Aidan Fitzgerald, who's gonna be teaching a couple of classes at the Rizzo Lab, both online as well as in person, new class we're launching. Um, and one of our bootcamp classes, which is a follow-up class for the online sections. Uh, Suzanne Reese is gonna be teaching a class focusing on comics poetry. Brent McDonald is teaching the, our mini comics class and one of our bootcamp intensive courses. Um, Bob Wallace is going to be teaching an online course um, focusing on comedy called Interrupting Expectations. And Sarah Shaw is going to be teaching a, class, a couple of a pair of classes, both focusing on narrative in a couple of different forms, one focusing on memoir and the other focusing on journalism. So um, I am the founder of the co-founder of the Rizzo Lab. And uh, some of you might be here uh, out of curiosity in the, uh, for the, the Rezo process, or maybe, maybe you're aware of our space, um, the Rezo Lab. Um, but to back up a little bit, for those of you that aren't completely clear on what Rezo is, I just wanted to sort of go over the basics of the process and what it is about our space um, that makes it so unique um, within this growing field, this phenomenon of artists taking these machines that really were not uh, intended to be used to create the kinds of vibrant posters that you might have seen um, out there in the world, various worlds of art and design. Um, and, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about what our, how our space is different than some other spaces that exist. Um, normally in pre-pandemic times, we'd be having this event in person. These are, this is an image from one of our first info sessions back in 2015. And I would have had a chance uh, to do a printing demo of the machine, show you what these prints look like up close, maybe describe um, what goes into the process. I'll try to explain it, but also have, you know, possibly occasionally we do, we are able to have some of our visitors make some test prints. Um, but, you know, tonight we're gonna try to, although you're not gonna be able to leave this virtual info session with one of our color charts, it's kind of a sneaky what is uh, this? advertisement for one of our, uh, your site. If everyone can mute their uh, their their mics, uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, but you know, despite that, hopefully you can come away with at least some visual blasts of um, some examples of what Rizo is capable of, what these machines are um, are able to do with the proper training, the proper background. So, of course, the thing about Rizo graph printing is it's all about the hands-on technique um, in contrast to so much of art and design and so much of our culture has kind of moved to digital spaces. We of course had to shut down our, our physical space and for about a year and a half, we were running online classes. Um, we were gonna continue to offer online remote classes for those of you that are not based in New York City. Um, and the idea with these classes is we, we distilled the, the most important aspects of risograph printing and try to figure out what can be communicated um, online remotely. What are the most, what is, what is the value of learning how to use these machines, um, learning how to design images for these machines um, without even you know, actually running one yourself. Because um, uh, at the end of the day, this is sort of how Rezograph presents itself. They see themselves as sort of a competitor to Epson, a competitor to some of these traditional copy machines. Um, companies that, that basically just provide basic copies. But um, the question is, what is it about risograph printing that allows us to, um, that, that you know, explains why there's such a phenomenon around it? Well, the, the main thing about risograph printing is that it's not, you can, you know, these machines look like copy machines. They look like laser printers, but in actuality, these machines function a lot more like uh, printmaking machines. Layers are printed on top of each other one at a time. And to really get the most of this technique, you need to know the fundamentals that go into um, creating images for traditional printing. So um, essentially you're printing with these drum cylinders as you see in this previous photo. Um, for every color that we have, we have a separate drum uh, that you would design an image, a layer for, and then you have to basically um, use this economy of limited palette to create vibrant images by overlapping um, these layers. And you can see some of the results. For example, this print by one of our previous artists in residence, Natalie Andrewson. Um, this print by another one of our artists in residence. Um, so our space essentially 
and this, you know, there's beyond just making individual prints and zines and publications, um, there's a whole lot that can be done by using this medium to scale up to make experimental prints if you're more interested in making installation art or art for exhibitions. Um, so um, to go to kind of go back to the way that we started, back in 2015, I was approached by Nathan Fox, the chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program. And uh, he was looking, he was uh, looking for support um, at the School of Visual Arts to see if there was anyone who was interested in partnering with him on starting a space dedicated to this printing medium. Um, and he was connected to me that I'd had some experience with this medium. And uh, so we started the space back in 2015 with uh, one faculty member, which happened to be me, one employee, which also happened to be me, um, a small team of enthusiastic but not very well informed student assistants. And we launched two classes, they filled, we added a mini comics class, that one filled, we continued to grow, we added a fourth continuing education class, we added workshops for graduate students. And the whole idea with the space was to train students at the highest level in terms of how to use, how to take design skills um, from print design processes like commercial offset CMYK printing, silkscreen, lithography, how can you apply these to the risograph process and really make the most, uh, make, you know, make the best out of this medium, uh, no matter what it is that you do, if you wanna make publications, if you're a photographer, if you're an illustrator, if you're a painter, we basically, the idea is we empower our students to have these skills to be able to really um, make really powerful images and use our space. Um, our, it's, it's also a different kind of model in terms of how we account for the materials used and the time that's used in the space. It's basically a flat rate model. So everyone pays the same lab fee, which, which comes with, it's, uh, you know, it's part of the cost of the class. Um, and after a few sessions in class, you're able to then book time, book printing time outside of um, your class time, which is where you really get all of your printing done. Class time is really for research and development, for demonstrations, for getting your skills down, for testing things out, for making the kind of mistakes that you need to make to learn um, what not to do, and maybe um, end up with some mistakes that uh, might change the direction of what, whatever project it is that you want to make. Um, and then, you, and then you, you take all that knowledge and you apply it to your process outside of class. So you book time. We have, we're open seven days a week um, and we have an active booking schedule. So all our machines are bookable by our students. Each student who is currently enrolled in a class can pay, uh, you know, if they, if they paid the lab fee, they can book up to six hours per week. Um, of printing time, which is plenty of time to get uh, even the heaviest printing job done. So what's really nice about this space is a sort of a community has formed um, where you have artists it's become a crossroads of art directors, artists, illustrators, photographers, um, you know, also undergraduate BFA students. Everyone's mixing during the open lab time, seeing what everyone else is printing and all kinds of connections are being made. And nowhere is this more evident than at our end of semester event called the Print Slam. These are some posters advertising it. And hopefully we'll be able to start this back up again um, starting this spring, um, you know, conditions permitting. We didn't have a Print Slam this fall. We did successfully reopen. We had classes um, this, this fall uh, and we had some workshops over the summer. Um, but normally this is a chance for students to Basically, whatever they've made during the semester, the, the, uh, the Rezo Lab staff, we create a pop-up exhibition um, and show and, uh, and kind of print sale. Um, and you know, it's, it's a chance for students to work towards this event and actually sell their work. All the proceeds go directly back to the students. So it's really a great event. You get to see all the things that have been made. You see all the ways people have been using these machines, which were designed to make um, menus, church programs, spreadsheets, and they're using them to make multicolor, vibrant, beautiful works of art publications. Um, our space has, you know, we started at a kind of a, the perfect time when, when the, the awareness of this process was just starting to spread across various worlds of art and design. Um, 
And we quickly sort of kind of set a standard for the instruction and also a number of our students that took classes at our space ended up really making a name for themselves using this medium um, and using some of the techniques that we taught them. So we've gotten a lot of attention from even outside of the SVA community at large. This is a feature um, on the Rizzo Lab that was published recently in a, um, a magazine based out of uh, Guangzhou, China, um, focusing on design called Design 360, with an eight page spread on the Rizzo Lab, focusing on us and a number of other um, Rizzo presses. Um, I would definitely recommend you check out our somewhat recently redesigned website. We launched it last year, but we're very proud of the site that was put together with scans of Rizzo texture. So all the graphics you see on the site are actually derived from assets that were physically printed. Um, we have a gallery, we're constantly adding prints to it so you can see examples of what some other students have made, what some other artists have made in our space and also the work of faculty and staff. So um, that being said, um, just wanna give you all a little bit of background in terms of my own work. Um, of course, uh, you know, we, I, uh, in addition to running the Rizzo Lab, I also have multiple um, different art careers that I'm also running concurrently that overlap and, and relate to, um, to, to my work as an educator and also um, the administrator here at the Rizzo Lab. So we reopened this summer, this is a poster we designed. Uh, and kind of the spirit of the space um, definitely is informed by some of the experience that I had as an artist. In terms of my own work, I am a, I'm quite multidisciplinary, but I'm a painter. Um, I do commercial illustration work for various venues, such as, you know, this was a night for a nightclub in Bushwick called Elsewhere Space. I work with musicians and sometimes do album covers, uh, some editorial illustration. And of course, I also make risograph prints. Um, but my background is in printmaking. Um, so when I was in art school as an undergrad, I was studying illustration, but I, I really didn't feel like I wanted to limit myself to just making work uh, for some kind of commercial application. I really wanted to develop my voice. I wanted to be active in the world of fine art. And I also was starting to uh, become interested in this world of underground publications, this kind of um, the crossroads between the world of gallery artists and the world of people making uh, you know, publications, small, small run uh, you know, artist books. Um, where all that kind of met for me was in the world of printmaking. Studying printmaking gave me a foundation um, and helped me kind of really learn about color and also production. And um, it can be very useful to have a craft that, that you can, um, where you, you have the work that you make um, in your studio, you have, um, you have the content and then you have a process where you have to follow things step by steps. And that process can inform some of the decisions that you have to make. So, um, that was really helpful to, helpful to me, and it also allowed me um, a way to make editions that got my work beyond, you know, got my work further than it probably would have gotten if I was um, if I wasn't making editions that were affordable. Um, and so, but after a number of years of you know making using printmaking, making editions, making um, screen prints, um, I got a little tired of making. I started. I was kind of using printmaking more as a way to scale up. You know, rather than a way to um, a way to make uh, to make you know multiples of the same image, um, a way to kind of scale up to make to make paintings, to make sort of works on different mediums, um, and you know, I uh, you know I, I had I I'd used printmaking to 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 open up other opportunities, both for exhibitions and in terms of uh, various publishers working with me, but some of the books that I was making, the artist books that I was making, really wouldn't have been affordable for someone like me. You know, they kind of so much labor went into them that they had to become these kind of precious objects. So it was about 2010 that I'd been active in the world of zines and underground comics and um, artist books for a number of years. Um, and a friend started talking to me about this machine you've got, which is an automated, screen printing machine as you described it and I had no idea how to conceptualize it. I was like, he was like, it's it's like a it's called a risograph. And it's like a screen printing machine, but it's all automated. It's you know you just you basically just press buttons. And I I was, you know, I I imagined either something that looked very steampunk that maybe was running on diesel, where you'd have a bucket of water on the end 
you get pay on your shoes because that was my experience with printmaking. Um, it was a very messy, spontaneous process. It's very physical. Or maybe it was something very high tech, like a robot that kind of flew across the room um, that you controlled with your phone. Um, so I had all these expectations. And when I actually saw the machine, I was honestly extremely disappointed. It didn't look like this. This is one of the newer models. It actually looked far clunkier, far more retro. I was looking around for the Rezo and he was like, dude, it's right in front of you. I really was not impressed. Um, but you know, I had a project that I had in mind um, that I'd been working on uh, with an artist based in London. And so, you know, I decided to take a chance on this machine. Um, and in a day I was able to basically produce uh, a book that would have taken me hundreds of hours and probably months of production if I were to do it with traditional techniques that I had access to. Um, because this process had both the quality of printmaking, but it had the speed of a copy machine, I was able to price that first edition that I made at a much, um, you know, at a much more affordable rate, I was able to make a bigger edition, an edition of 100 books, um, you know, as opposed to an edition of 10 books, where each book could be sold for $20, $30, as opposed to $500 or $1,000. Um, so my art book publishing practice developed into basically a publishing practice. I started eventually working with other artists, um, and that was so, you know, that's kind of how I got involved with Rezograph printing back at this point about 11 years ago. And that led to basically a founding a press um, that has become sort of the small business and a very important part of my own practice to the point where we've, we've made editions that, you know, we work with outside book binders um, and, you know, and, and really have made a couple of editions that are proper books. Um, so I'm gonna be teaching two classes where um, I basically, I take all the knowledge that I, um, I've gleaned over the years with Rezograph printing, which was a process of applying what I learned um, in printmaking and applying that to Rezo printing. Uh, the first class is an intro class, and essentially what you end up with at the end of the class, the whole point is for you to build up a print design toolkit. So we go over a number of different techniques, working with spot colors, working with duotones, uh, working with techniques like posterization and a uh, version of Rezo CMYK. So spot colors, just a single color overlapping two colors to get a third color, overlapping three colors to get a variety of colors. And how do you work with, you know, more, getting more with less. Um, posterization, which is a more graphic approach. Duotone, so starting to work with blended colors and translating photographic images, CMYK, adapted to risograph printing. So how do we take a full color image and reproduce it with just four layers of ink? Um, and the other class I'm teaching is also an introductory class, but we learn some of the same, we learn basically the same skills, um, but from the very beginning, we learn them uh, with, in the context of preparing to make a publication. Um, so what goes into that? Uh, apart from the binding, the logistics, the measuring, making sure um, everything's kind of in the right place. How do you make a booklet? What are different techniques? Um, how does all the content work together? How does it flow? Um, so registration is open for both of these classes. There's a, there's a few spots left. Um, I believe there's more spots left in the intro class. We also make the connection in the zine class. I try to contextualize things. Um, with the broader history of, of print, going all the way back to Gutenberg, and even before um, Gutenberg, the origins of print and how um, printing really changed history. Even Martin Luther, you know, all these different um, you know figures throughout history, William Blake, um, examples of the prehistory of zines, like the fanzines of the 1940s and 50s, these sci-fi nerds that made their own uh, fan fiction and fan art to connect with each other in counterculture, the underground press of the 1960s, um, you know, various figures like Emily Douglas, uh, the Black Panthers and the punk publications. So we try to make the connection um, between risograph printing and this very modern phenomenon of artists buying old machines um, from small businesses, learning how to fix them and really becoming publishers. So um, that is basically, uh, those are the two classes I'm offering. Um, 
what we're going to do tonight is uh, we're going to save the questions for the end. So um, but feel free to add your questions to the chat and we'll get through them um, once, we, once we go through all the other classes. So I hope I didn't take up too much time, but I'm going to just go ahead and introduce our next speaker who is Aidan Fitzgerald. I'm going to read his bio so you can, you can hear a little bit about um, his background and where he's coming from. So Aiden's actually, a, he joined our faculty this past fall teaching the online class. And this semester, he's gonna be teaching an in-person boot camp, um, which is a follow-up training session for the online class. If you wanna take the knowledge um, that you built up in the online class and you wanna then gain access to the Rezo Lab that comes with six weeks or seven weeks of access. Um, and he's also, we're also launching a new class that's going to be focusing on abstract comics and artist books. So Aidan Fitzgerald received a BFA in painting and drawing from the University of Washington. He was the co-founder of the Free Seattle All Comics Newspaper Intruder and the graphic designer for the Seattle Small Press Festival April. He started Cold Q Press in 2015 and dedicated his art practice, practice to publishing and showcasing other artists and illustrators. Over the years, Cold Cube has published over 120 artists and writers from all over the world. He was the managing editor of Grandma Poetry, and he has taught classes at Western Washington University, Hugo House, Seattle, and Seattle Central Community College. He lives and works in New York. So Aiden, if you wanna just uh, go ahead and take it away and be yeah. dazzle. Uh, I, so, I, in, I intend to dazzle. Thank you, Pan. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick. So y'all can take a gander at what I have to share. Um, yeah, piggybacking on what um, Pan said, uh, I uh, am a sort of recent uh, faculty member just joining the Rezo Lab last fall. Um, and I've been teaching this uh, Rezo Lab remote series. Uh, it's basically the online version of that uh, intro to print design that uh, Pan was talking about. So for those of you that are not in New York, this is an online course uh, where you can learn how to set up your work in order to be best printed uh, on a risograph printer. Uh, and if you are in New York or if you're planning on going there soon, then after taking this course, um, you will qualify to take a, a, a two day boot camp, uh, which I will also, I'm teaching one session in March and I believe Ren is teaching another in, um, in January. But let me uh, do this in full screen so that y'all can see everything. So uh, if you wanna search on the SVA website, this is the title of this class. Uh, it runs from January 26th to March 9th. It's six sessions uh, meeting Wednesday evenings from seven to nine um, and just gonna start this off with uh, my computer freezing. There we go. Uh, so this is a, uh, um, a piece from a book that I made when I was an artist in residence at the Riza Lab. It's sort of like how I got introduced to the Riza Lab, but not my introduction to risograph printing. Um, I have been printing on a risograph for about eight years. I run a, a small press publication studio called Cold Cube. Uh, and these next couple images are from just uh, a couple, several different pages of books that I've published over the years. Uh, once again, these are all printed on a risograph. So I selected these pages so that you could see kind of uh, what is possible um, on a risograph printer. And uh, the sort of intention um, or the goal of this class is uh, to give every student a working understanding of how the Rezo works and how to best prepare their work for print. Um, so, uh, Pan mentioned that the Rezo Lab is not just for designers or illustrators or cartoonists, it's for artists of any medium uh, working in a variety of different styles and aesthetics. The Rezo can adapt to photographers, designers, animators, people working in film, um, you know, painters, people working through a lot of different ideas. The Rezo can adapt and work in a lot of different ways. Uh, and by taking my class, you can kind of learn how to adapt the risograph printing process uh, to what you need. So um, going through just a quickly, just a sort of surface level of uh, some of the stuff that we'll be talking about in the class. This is the most basic of images that I start off with in the first class, which is 
uh, this uh, sort of color and value chart. This is what a print would look like, but then this is what the file for that print would end up looking like. So we're gonna talk about how we're gonna go from these black and white or grayscale files into making full color images. Um, this is my favorite uh, sculpture of a recently stabbed person. Uh, it is called the Dying Gaul. It's like a wonderful, it's my favorite, it's one of my favorites. But uh, I bring this up because I use it as an example to show uh, the different processes that we'll be learning, right? So here's the original image. And then the first class we'll be talking about spot color and um, trapping, uh, gradients, you know, working with uh, different colors to recreate uh, an image in the most sort of uh, 2D uh, flat illustrative manner, right? And then the next class, we'll start talking about posterization, right? Same image, same colors, different process, but all set up for printing on the risograph printer. The next class, we'll go into the duotones uh, and half tones, and we're gonna begin to start uh, talking about uh, printing photographs on the risograph printer. And then the class after that, oh, this is so small. Um, this is actually a four color print. Uh, it's sort of what we would call at the Riesel Lab an anti-CMYK. So instead of the full, um, pink, aqua, black, and yellow of CMYK. It's actually light teal, violet, uh, yellow, and uh, pink. So uh, these are all sort of ideas that we'll be going over in class week by week. Um, and then uh, at the end of the class, uh, we will go, be going over some much more nerdy stuff about the risograph. This is for those of us who know about printing. On the left is an example of a screened angle image. So it, this is one of the image processes of the Rizzo is a screen angle. And on the right is grain touch, right? So uh, for those of you that have risographs at home or for, who are familiar with risograph work, what this class is meant to do is to kind of unlock the mystery uh, of risograph printing. Um, and then at the end of the class, uh, I print, I make a print portfolio for you. So you take all of the work that you have um, made over, or all the stuff that you've learned over the, the, the six weeks and apply it to a print portfolio that I will print for you uh, at the Rezo Lab. Um, this is, these are examples of some student work from my most recent course. These are four color images. Um, and yeah, one of the big things about this course is that uh, after taking this six week course all online, you qualify for a two day boot camp in person. So um, if once again, if you're sort of out of state, you can take the course and learn how to print uh, on your own. But if you're in New York, you can take this course online and then uh, go to the boot camp. I will be teaching one on uh, March 12th and 13th, which is a Saturday and Sunday. It's just two days, uh, four hour, two four hour days where we get like hands on experience to apply some of the file prep that we learned in the class itself. Um, and I am teaching another class as well. Uh, oh, uh, one more thing, important to note about this course. Um, a lot of the stuff that we learn in this class can be applied to other print mediums, right? So a lot of these methods can be applied to screen printing uh, or digital design uh, and photo editing. So um, if you're intending on working on uh, risograph prints, it's great. If, you're in, if you just wanna learn about the process and maybe get some new tools for your toolkit, it's also a great class for you. Um, and then my other course that I'm teaching, this will be uh, the sort of maiden voyage of this uh, art books and abstract comic course um, is an in-person course. It's not online uh, and it'll be 12 sessions, um, Tuesdays from 6.30 to 9.30. So it'll be a, an evening night school. We'll be looking at art books and abstract comics. Um, and I bring this slide up so that if you wanna search on the SVA website, you can find it pretty easily and, and sign up. Um, once again, starting with an example of my own work, um, I uh, sort of got to printing and publishing by way of painting. I was, uh, I was a BFA in painting at the University of Washington and I was making these large scale paintings and was sort of feeling kind of unsatisfied by them. So I started making drawings on paper and then collapsing them down into books. And then that got me really just obsessed with uh, art books. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed about art books, this is just some other 
recent collaborative work that I've worked on with a couple of different artists. But one of the things that I've noticed about abstract comics and art books is that they're kind of defined in the negative, as in they are defined as something that is not the other, right? So it's a comic, but with no people in it, or it's kind of, like, it's, it's not a painting because it's got a book, or it's like, you know, I think it's, it's kind of like a collection of drawings, but it's, it's not a single drawing, right? It's sort of defined by what it is not. So the intention with this class is to, to make a sort of positive, um, I don't necessarily mean like an optimistic, uh, the intention of this class is to make a sort of like, oh, this is what an art book is. Uh, this is what an abstract comic is. This is what it can do. Um, so these are all collaborative works that I've worked on um, with a couple different artists in Seattle. Um, and this is sort of getting more in towards what, what is a traditional comic, right? The cell structure. Um, and then this is moving on to some of the work that I've published uh, as um, the publisher of Cold Cube. Uh, and my intention with Cold Cube is to really focus on uh, art books and abstract comics, the type of printed matter that exists, exists between the lines of comics and poetry and abstract work and paintings and drawings, sort of um, books that are hard to put a name on. Um, and a lot of this class will be involved in just looking at other artists' work, taking some lessons from them and then being able to apply them to our own work, right? So uh, there's you know, work such as, this is a, an artist by, that I published named Cynthia Alfonso. And um, this is another artist, Jason Miles. These are very sort of like cell-based comic work, but there's also art books on the other side of things that are not necessarily intent, intending to like deliver a story, right? So we can learn from all different types um, of books. And I also wanna look at narrative comics, figurative work, and see how a lot of narrative work has an undercurrent of abstraction um, within it, or how we can use abstract compositions to enhance our figurative work. So if you're an illustrator or you're um, an animator or cartoonist and you're not necessarily interested in abstract work, but you're maybe looking at a different way to enhance your work, it's an, it's an opportunity to kind of take some lessons from abstract comics and apply them to your own, uh, to your own process. Um, and lastly, this, is, this class, a lot of it is gonna be me dumping a bunch of my art book collections. This is a little secret uh, trapper keeper here. Shout out to Pan. A lot of the comic, uh, a lot of the books that I'm gonna be dropping on the table, we're gonna spend a good amount of time in the class just looking through them. Like what, what is this? How did they do this? Um, why are they doing this? What, what choice did they make here? And why did they make that choice? Um, and because we are studying in the Rizzo lab, we're not just thinking about the the messaging or the aesthetics of these books, we're also thinking, we're coming from a foundation of how these books were made, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna go from start to finish uh, making our own art books, uh, making our own abstract comics while learning what exactly those things are. So uh, I'm really excited about it. Um, like I said, it's the maiden voyage for this class. So we'll all be kind of learning, uh, discovering this stuff together. And uh, I hope that you join me. It will be loads of laughs. Thanks, Aiden. I'm excited. I, I want to sign up for your class. Actually. You should. Uh, let's see. You just, you just might see me on the first day. Um, <laughs> thanks, Aiden. And I'm seeing a lot of questions, interesting and relevant questions in the chat. We're going to be, we're trying to address a few of them, um, a few of the obvious ones, but we'll, we'll, we're going to circle back and uh, take a look at some of the questions um, and try to answer them at the very end so we can have all the instructors kind of speak to speak to things that might various people might be interested in. So moving right along, um, next up we've got Suzanne Reese. Suzanne Reese is a writer and illustrator who creates visual essays and comics poetry and writes creative nonfiction, short fiction and poetry. In addition to teaching, she also works as a professional copywriter in advertising. Her interests include non-sequential visual storytelling, book arts and DIY publishing. Suzanne holds a bachelor's degree in German language and literature and a master's degree in art history. And she earned an MFA in visual narrative from the School of Visual Arts. She was a Fulbright scholar in Munich, Germany and Whitney Research Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her work has appeared in No Tokens, O Reader Magazine, 
Red Ink Poetry Comics, among others. Suzanne is currently at work on a comics poetry collection and is in the process of starting a micro press and zine. So Suzanne, if you want to take it away, um, go ahead and, uh, and you can start. All right, let me um, share my screen and go, um, let's see. Let me try this again. Um, think that you are going to have to live with um, with the side slides here. Um, so I am teaching a class, Comics Poetry, Experimenting with Text and Image. It's on Wednesday evenings, um, and it, the first class starts on January 26th, goes to April 20th. Um, it is online, and um, the class is a mix of synchronous and asynchronous. So there will be live Zoom class on Wednesday night for two hours. Um, those classes are recorded, um, and then there's a certain amount of work to do on Canvas, which is the online learning system that um, that SBA uses. There are readings, and you would post work and take part in discussions um, and videos and other things for you to watch. Um, my work, I um, let's see if I could do this. Um, I write poetry. Um, I do visual essays and I make comics. Um, I mostly do personal narratives. I like doing um, autobio comics and diary comics and also doing poetry comics, um, which is something I've gotten into really over the last couple of years. Um, comics poetry, like what is that? Um, comics poetry um, combines um, elements from comics like panels and word balloons, um, images, they can also use photographs. You could use collage um, with poetic language. Um, and poetry works a little different. It's not telling a story. It's more about evoking a mood or an emotion or um, you know, bringing someone along sort of on an experience. Um, and the, the language is important in those. Um, this is one that I did called um, Resetting the Theory of Time. Um, and just a few, you know, short panels. Um, the class is, um, it is for, whoop, I think we, yes, sorry. So the class is for any level of experience. Um, it is fully online. So a mix, like I said, of synchronous and asynchronous um, classes, it's generative. So the point is for, you to make a lot of work. And we will take an approach that focuses on experimentation and play. Um, I would imagine that, you know, I've already got um, several people signed up for the class. There will be a mix of people. There will be some people who are poets. There will be some people who are illustrators and cartoonists. And there may be some people who have never done both. And we are going to approach it um, so that everybody feels um, like they can make something. We'll explore different ways of approaching comics poetry by looking at and discussing examples, and we'll make our own and discuss those. Um, there will be a chance to adapt an existing poem. We will do collage poems, found poems. We'll work with found images, and we'll also write our own poems and draw our own poetry comics. Um, you'll come away with that, away from the class with a portfolio of completed comics poems of different, different types. Um, Let's see, uh, what else? So um, for the classes that I've been teaching, in addition to this class, I also teach a, a writing class that's geared towards visual artists. I have started a zine to publish um, student work. This is the zine that is currently um, at the printer right now, just so you can kind of see. Um, this was a writing class, and so it has some people um, wrote poetry, some people um, did creative writing, writing and included an, an illustration, but um, for this poetry comics class, I will be making a zine and publishing a zine um, for people who in the class who want to do that, um, and you would get a print copy, and the school use it, will use these copies to um, promote the school and your work, um, and I will promote it on my own social media, but it's a, an opportunity to um, 
to have something published and to to be edited um, and work with an editor, which would be me. So um, I hope that some of you will come and make some comics poetry with me. Um, Joan gave the the link to my um, to my website, but you can find information me about me and the class on SBA's um, website. And I hope to see some of you there. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so next up, we've got Ren McDonald's. He's going to be talking about his in person Rizzo cl uh, class focusing on mini comics, and um, he's also teaching one of our follow up boot camps. Um, Ren McDonald is an illustrator and cartoonist based in Brooklyn, New York. He's the author of the cyberpunk epic Sparks um, and dystopian revenge story Cyber Realm, as well as several other self-published mini comics, including his current series Precinct X99. He edits the genre-based comics anthology X Mag for Piao. He's worked with publications such as the New York Times, The New Yorker, Vice, and Wired and also recently worked on the Midnight Gospel for Netflix. So Ren, um, go ahead and uh, take it away. Cool, thanks, Pan. Alrighty, so thanks for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about myself, then about the class that I teach. Um, so like Pan said, my name is Ren McDonald. I've been using uh, Risograph uh, in my work for probably the last 10 years at least. Um, I make a number of comics, uh, many comics, which I've self-published and I've worked with a, a variety of publishers as well, um, as well as uh, doing a lot of uh, editorial illustration. Um, and uh, ever since I first started working with Risograph, uh, I really got the bug. Um, I, I think um, it really clicked with like the kind of like clean lines that I wanted to make and um, the content that I wanted to put into my work. Uh, so it's even found uh, its way into my digital process as well. Like the way that I set up color files is very similar to the way that I set up Riso files. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about my stuff. Um, the class that I teach is mini comics from page to production. Uh, and for anyone that doesn't know, a mini comic uh, is uh, comics that are typically self-published, handmade, and are on the smaller side. So it's uh, comics that are also zines. Um, so the, our main focus in the class is to follow a step-by-step -step process to create a mini comic um, and go over Riso printing and zine production basics along the way. So we actually follow um, a very specific process because I, I think that um, creating comics, um, it's a lot of work and the task can be really daunting. Uh, and I constantly am getting questions outside of the class, like, oh, well, how do you start a comic? The hardest part is actually getting started. And I think having this framework um, in place uh, really uh, lends itself to productivity and being able to just like jump into the process. So uh, we go through like um, starting with an idea to an outline to a thumbnail sketching, um, to rough artwork, to final artwork, to colors, then finally to um, printing with the risograph um, and then zine production. So putting that all together into your final mini comic. Um, and so some of the things we'll be creating, um, two main mini comics in the class. The first one is a single sheet zine, which is like an eight page zine that can be made out of a single sheet of paper. So we start right off the bat with that, uh, just to get um, everyone loosey goosey uh, and ready to spend the majority of the rest of the class on that 12 to 20 page mini comic. But we do go through, um, you know, a lot of risograph basics, uh, like that were mentioned by Pan and Aiden. Um, so we do go over, uh, you know, spot color printing, uh, two color printing, multicolor printing, uh, faux CMYK, duotone. Um, so we do, do go through all of that uh, throughout the course. And then at the end, when you finally finished your artwork, um, for your mini comic, you can kind of pick and choose what you want from those processes uh, to apply to the to the final. Um, and of course, uh, 
you know, you'll be able to take advantage of the Rizzo Lab all along the way. Uh, and you can go in and make prints, uh, illustrated prints, or, you know, pretty much whatever you want. So um, the structure, so the class, um, th so this is actually wrong. It's not 10 sessions, it's actually 12 sessions. Um, and it's like a 60-40 split between comics and Riso. So the main focus is comics. So we do a lot of workshopping in the class uh, of your process and, you know, each step in that process along the way, you know, we chat about it um, and give each other feedback, uh, which is always uh, really fun uh, and interesting. Um, but the, the first half of the class, it's a lot more rig rigorous. We're going through a lot more of those risograph techniques. Uh, and then the second half of the class is more so you focusing on wrapping up that mini comic. Um, these are some examples of uh, past student work, uh, mini comics that have been made in the class. And something that I think is so, so fun about the mini comics class is uh, the requirement for your final mini comic is to make um, enough copies so that everyone in the class can have one. So if there's 10 people in the class, then you walk away on the last day of class with 10 new mini comics. Uh, and I think that's always really fun. Um, Uh, yeah, and it's it's going to be fun. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of these machines uh, and, uh, you know, explore how you can use this copy machine technology um, to your own work and your own practice. Um, so in addition to the, the mini comics class, uh, I am teaching one boot camp uh, that's at the end of this month, uh, and this is geared towards people that have already taken an online class. Um, however, if you do have prior RISO experience, uh, reach out to me or Pan, uh, and we can talk about uh, squeezing you in as well. Um, and then, yeah, this is just from the, the RISO Lab site on the courses site. Um, yeah, and those are the classes I have to offer. And I will say, um, you know, after doing the online for so many semesters, you know, during the pandemic and everything, it, it was so refreshing to be back in the classroom um, and seeing the energy there uh, between all the students um, and the passion that goes into making these mini comics is just always so inspiring. Uh, and yeah, uh, let me know if you have any questions at the end of this. Uh, and thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ren, as always. Um, and for all of you, I've seen lots of questions about uh, Rezo printing in general, we're gonna we're gonna get to all this stuff, um, and I think uh, like a quick sort of roundtable between uh, the three Rezo instructors on kind of the basics, kind of the very basics of what the difference is, for example, between Rezo and Inkjet. Um, we'll try we'll try to kind of make that clear, but also that's a good incentive to, to take the class. So if you're wondering what the difference is, you can actually find that out firsthand. So, all right. So next up, um, we've got Bob Wallace who is a storyteller working in comedy, comedy, comics, animation, and film. He has served as host and producer of the alternative comedy shows, Zebro, The Moon, and Ideation. In collaboration with artist uh, Tad Kimball, he created the animated series, True Facts About the 44th President and Steven Tyler's iPad. His first comics work, Adventures of the Moss Babies, made its debut at Emerald City Comic Con where it was picked up for distribution by Comixology. So Bob, if you want to explain a little bit about your own experience and, and what uh, students might, um, you know, what hoops they might jump through if they take your class, why don't you go ahead and um, yeah, take right. it from here. Yeah, I would love to. I will definitely, um, yeah, we'll hear about the hoops because some of them can be a little scary. Uh, but first I just want to add a little addendum to my biography because, uh, I have uh, also taken uh, Ren's mini comics class where I made uh, this baby. Oh, is my virtual thing going to mess this up? Okay, here we go. There's this uh, was my final project in Ren's class. And you can see the lovely interaction between blues and pinks, or maybe you can't because this virtual background is destroying it. But rest assured, there is a story in here that I created beginning, middle and end uh, in Ren's class and everything that we've been discussing about uh, community and how you sort of 
rub elbows with people from various disciplines and walks of life in that lab is all true. Uh, it kind of reinvigorated my career as a creative professional, uh, to be honest, um, because at the same time, uh, I also started to uh, work with uh, the visual narrative program as a uh, guest faculty member. Um, so uh, I am uh, honored to be asked uh, time and again to run the final uh, RPG style um, exam that they have in the in the summertime. And uh, there are a few, actually, a few alum of that here. Uh, now, now members of the faculty, um, but I can also uh, endorse that program itself, having been um, a, a quasi faculty member myself. And um, just basically, whether it's online in the last few years or the kind of buzz of, of being there on campus, um, definitely get yourself involved with one class or another and see where it takes you. If it's not, um, <clears throat> if it's not mine in particular, there any of the classes listed associated with the Rizzo Lab uh, is a um, good foot in the door for any story. So unfortunately, you know, these things happen. Um, sometimes technical issues can come up. Can you hear me? You sound loud and clear to me, Bob. I think Pan is having the technical difficulty. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, well, technical difficulties, notwithstanding, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to break into my, uh, slideshow here and get into the content of this class, which, um, let me see here. Hopefully this will do me, do me right tonight. Here we go. Uh, and that should be full screen. I hope. Um, okay, excellent. So uh, this course is a sort of comedy theory slash practice course, as I like to call it. It's called Interrupting Expectations. Um, and it is a great course for, uh, like I said, any storyteller or creative professional. Um, I am a person who enjoys working in fields, uh, that require storytelling skills, but I still myself do like to, to brush up on this. So uh, these classes tend to be a mix of, you know, people who are um, at the beginning of their career. Sometimes people are mid-career and taking these uh, as well. And then other people are, are veterans looking to pick, brush up on new technologies like Rizograph. So we always enjoy a good mix of students and disciplines, especially in this class. Um, so, do you ever wonder what makes funny funny uh, and why some people are quote unquote effortlessly hilarious while others aren't? Um, comedy can be misconstrued as a mystical, you either have it or you don't format, but um, joke writing, humor writing, whatever you want to call it, is also a mechanical, knowable set of tools with which every storyteller should arm themselves. I know should is a strong word, but I do, um, you know, with the exception of things like uh, Dune, you do see comedy in almost every facet of culture now. Like there's things, certain things are very humorless uh, that, <laughs> that pass through our radar um, still, but uh, for the most part in storytelling, in pop culture, in comics, in, uh, in film, television, uh, gaming, um, uh, at least familiarity with comedy is going to be hopefully of some use to anyone interested uh, in using it, or at least being able to understand how they are being used against us, uh, because they often are, and that's another big part of this class, is we're learning how to break down the assumptions inherent in any given joke, um, which in a, a culture where comedy is so ubiquitous is also just a, a great way of knowing what's coming at you every day, um, being able to use those things uh, yourself. Uh, so there's a little bit about me here. Uh, I just, as speaking to my own sense of authority on the matter, uh, like I've been lucky to share the stage with uh, 
veteran comedians like um, Michael Showalter, Chris Gethard, um, Janine Garofalo, uh, and then, you know, uh, younger comedians as well, like Julio Torres, um, River Ramirez, Joe Pera, and I could sort of go on and on and on because that's the nature of the alternative New York comedy scene. It was very, uh, that I was fortunate enough to be involved in and still maintain some uh, familiarity with, with um, and that tends to be the basis of the familiarity um, and authority on the matter. But again, we won't get into hopefully too much uh, name dropping and, and that sort of thing. It's, we generally stick to, um, to the text uh, and we'll get into the three units, um, each of which has an asynchronous lecture associated with it. So this will be 10 live sessions with me and with your classmates. Uh, but we're also the pillars of the class are these three um, main units or lectures uh, where we also have these exercises associated. The first being comedy as a genre, um, where it's the most ubiquitous form of humor writing that we see, so sitcoms, animation, uh, even commercials. Uh, but basically in these exercises, we'll learn how to count jokes uh, comparing our numbers with one another, sort of um, figure out how, you know, things like jokes per minute and identifying what actually we mean uh, by joke and definitely defining a lot of terms that you might've heard and at least making sure that we all mean the same thing when we say them in this class. So uh, we'll explore examples of the comedy genre which will identify uh, the elementary particles of comedy um, well, I'm sort of restating myself, so I'm just going to move into the second unit. Comedy as an art form, the performed live version of comedy, stand-up comedy as it's often referred to, but also one-person show or, um, you know, black box theater. There's a number of different ways of referring to it, and we're going to go somewhat broad um, so that we can just get a brief history of what I like to think of as modern comedy, um, beginning with Joan Rivers and going all the way up through uh, uh, modern comedians like Patty Harrison. Uh, so again, uh, I think I probably just said all of this, but here it is written in a more succinct way. So we move on. Um, finally, the third unit is comedy as an element in storytelling. And this is humor used in texts that are non-generic to comedy. So again, what I was talking about before in our culture, um, we do see whether it's on Netflix or at the movies, or again, like in our television commercials or comic books, uh, it doesn't have to be comedy for joke writing to have found its way in, especially um, in the 2020s. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And again, each of these um, units will have exercises and work from students associated with that. So you will be coming out of this generating material and generating hands-on familiarity with this, which uh, those are dangerous terms for a reason, because yes, you will be asked to perform humor. You, this, there, this does involve some measure of performance. And again, like I uh, say and caveat again and again, we go into this very gently. I like to provide a padded room in which for us to fail. You're supposed to fail and make mistakes. I know it's just about the scariest thing you can imagine for most people, but that is why we all sort of work together with one another. We all have various levels of experience with this and nobody judges each other. And we get through that part pretty quickly um, so that we can put these things to use in your chosen discipline, whether you're a cartoonist, whether you're a video editor, whether you wanna make a music video, whether you wanna make a website or an app. We did have somebody pitch an app last time we ran the class, which was great. Uh, it was very funny actually. Um, so yeah, this thing can take on all different types of uh, manifestations in your creative practice, but uh, the goals will be to identify and evaluate common structures in human writing identify and evaluate inherent assumptions in any given joke, basically 
unpacking, uh, deconstructing um, humor texts that exist, and then also learning how to generate our own lists and perform those uh, and create and perform pieces of written comedy with intention and clarity, which comes from mechanically breaking down other jokes, see how those work, see how they reveal our assumptions, um, and then doing your own version, hopefully adding some intention rather than just what gets a laugh. Uh, so we employ our humor writing practices eventually in a new original text of, like I said, your chosen discipline, whether that's uh, live performance uh, or, you know, any, any, it's, again, we've had uh, graphic novels, we've had um, sort of very short form sitcoms, we've had cartoons. So this thing can take all sorts of different forms. But the important thing is uh, that we learn that how, uh, to, to basically form a way to use these new skills uh, and ways of recognizing our culture. And rather than, um, you know, having them sort of be more noise or at the worst case weaponized against us, we need to understand more about how they work mechanically. And then we can begin to use that in our own work should we choose to, or if we don't, we know what we're ignoring. Uh, anyways, suffice to say, you don't have to be funny to be funny. You can learn how to do this. We've all learned how to do a lot of things that we didn't think we would know how to do as artists. So I would challenge you to, uh, to at least maybe look into this, uh, class listing on the wonderful SVA website as I kick it back to either Pan or perhaps Joe. Well, I just actually have a quick ringing endorsement of this class because I made this, oops, can you see that? Yeah, no, I'm on a wrong background. Anyway, I did a fantastically fun essay about my family and in the David Sedaris style that I've long admired. And I did a little book and I asked Pan to help me print it on the lithograph. So it is a beautiful marriage of all these things. That's all, I'll take it back to Pan now. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Jit. Thank you for that heartfelt endorsement. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm not sure what you saw on your end, but I, I just saw Bob freeze and I started giving a disclaimer and then uh, Zoom crashed for me, but I'm back. So I, I guess that was- Yeah, back to, I think we're up for Sarah now, right? Yeah, yeah. So back back uh, after six, uh, you know, after six info sessions online, it had to happen to me. Um, but uh, so our final presenter, uh, before we can take your questions and try to address some of the other questions that, that came up earlier is Sarah Shaw who is a comics artist, illustrator, visual arts educator, and a graduate of SVA's MFA Visual Narrative Program. She makes memoir and nonfiction comics about daily life, culture, travel, living abroad, and women from history. She spent 10 years working abroad in Korea, Colombia, and Nepal before moving to Boston, Massachusetts in 2020. Her comics and illustrations have recently appeared in the Boston Globe and the White House website. So go ahead, Sarah. Hi everyone, um, and thank you for that pan. Let me share my screen. All right, cool. All right, so I'll start talking a little bit about my graphic memoir class first. This semester I'll be teaching two different classes, um, graphic memoir along with a comics, a new comics journalism class, which is really exciting. Um, I've been in the process of developing that for the last few months, so that would be really fun to start this semester. But um, graphic memoir, I've been teaching for four semesters now. Um, and I really, it's, it's really amazing to see all of the different students that come to this class and all the different backgrounds. But really, it's just um, everyone who joins this class wants to tell personal stories and use text and image to create those narratives. So we've had, um, you know, people who write and don't have as much um, experience drawing and, you know, artists who don't have as much experience writing and then some who are new to everything as well. So it's, it's really great to have that um, dynamic to learn from each other in, you know, so many different ways. This is 10 sessions and it will be on Wednesday evenings. 
Um, it's a two hour synchronous class um, on Zoom. And then I also stay for an hour after class for anyone who has extra questions or just wants to talk more in depth about something during class. Um, and then all of, we do some, you know, in class drawing, but most of the work will be outside of class. So during class, um, we spend the first half critiquing our homework um, and then really, you know, engaging with each other in these like either breakout group discussions or full class critiques. And then the second half of class after a break is when I will present different, you know, topics in comics and then we will, you know, discuss that as a class. So it's really interactive and I really um, encourage students to talk as much as possible and, you know, the class um, has a really great community feel to it. Like a lot of um, students go on at the end of the course to create their own critique groups. And um, the way it's structured also is that students will upload their assignments to a discussion board so they can see everyone's work. And there's always just a lot of like really great comments that are left for students and, and ways that, you know, as, as long as I can really um, let students learn from each other is kind of the goal as well for the class. Um, so the first six weeks, we focus more on like shorter assignments. We'll do like one page comics, we'll do, you know, four panel comics, and we'll look at different um, elements in, you know, in pacing and timing and storytelling and, you know, crafting visuals and, you know, having text and image complement one another. So we'll look at lots of different artists who, you know, teach different storytelling forms, but then also we'll, we'll analyze, um, let me see. I think I just went by that slide. We'll analyze, um, you know, different work by a lot of artists who are working in the realm of graphic memoir. And then here are just a few examples of assignments, early assignments by students. Um, and, you know, in class, we will do some, you know, drawing exercises and, you know, prototyping exercises as well. Um, all right, my computer's a little slow. So, okay, here we go. Um, each semester, I also have a guest speaker come in and talk about their work. So we've had a, a couple different artists in the past. This semester will be Teresa Wong, who um, has recently published some stuff in The New Yorker. And she's she primarily began as a writer and, um, and then found comics and illustration a little bit later. So it'll be really fun to hear her perspective on her um, current work. And then for the last month of class, we create a longer narrative. So, you know, I say two to five pages, but sometimes they end up being a lot longer. I'm always like really blown away by the work that students create in this class. And we'll follow a process um, that starts, you know, with brainstorming, and then we learn some script writing, sketching thumbnails, penciling, inking, you know, lettering, adding narrative color, that sort of thing. Each week we'll talk about a different, you know, aspect. But during this time, we break off into small groups. So students have a lot more time to talk about their ideas and their stories with, you know, less, um, less people, and they're able to kind of you know, take that feedback and really get into um, the narrative. Here's an example just of one student's final project from the initial sketches and then going on to create the final art. And these projects look, you know, so different from one to one to the next two, which is the fun thing about this class as well. Um, so really, it's a chance to taking this class is a chance to experiment, take risks, really develop some creative problem solving skills or exercise those skills and just um, visualize your life experience and memories for in a new way and from a new perspective. So if you are interested in making personal work, then I would encourage you to sign up for this class and really join this group of people who are you know, interested in memoir and telling personal stories. And if you're more into other, you know, um, nonfiction comics. I'm teaching this class, Comics Journalism. Um, this will be 12 sessions on Tuesday evenings. 
And it follows the same exact course structure. We just, we focus more on um, different forms of nonfiction comics that aren't memoir and, and personal narrative as much. Sometimes they overlap a little bit, but in general, this will be more, more of a research-based um, comics class. So again, you know, same sort of, you know, critique and then talking about different um, topics each, you know, after the break in each class. Um, so really, you know, comics journalism is we make this work to see the world through someone else's eyes rather than, you know, telling our own stories and making ourselves a character in our work. Um, we'll talk about creating documentary sketches, reportage comics, op art pieces, um, illustrated reviews, informational comics, biographies, that whole, you know, explore a lot um, in that realm of, of nonfiction. And this really like growing field of comics too that you see that are published in so many mainstream publications now as well. Um, well, again, look at a lot of different excerpts from a range of storytellers from different books to also um, newspapers and magazines and also, you know, more indie, you know, self-published stuff as well. And um, we'll have a guest speaker for this class as well, Sarah Glidden, who's been working in reportage comics for quite some time now. So it'll be really interesting to hear, you know, her perspective, her past work, and also the work that she's creating now. And yeah, and then the last four weeks, we'll create a longer narrative too. After we, you know, explore some different formats, then students will have the option to kind of choose something, a topic they're, you know, more interested in to spend some more time researching and crafting a narrative. Um, so, you know, we'll go over some co conducting interviews, crafting a story through a specific lens or angle, you know, um, methods for researching, collecting visual materials, and then the whole uh, process for actually making, writing and making the art as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about crafting pitches um, for publications where your work might fit as well, if that's something, that's, if that's a goal of yours and something that you're interested in. But I would say the main takeaway from both these classes too um, is the community that you'll find in um, students who are interested in making the same kind of work. And I think that's, and both of these classes are online. So they really give you an opportunity to connect with people from all over the country really, and also around the world. Um, there have been several students of mine who live in different countries and it's just really great to be able to find um, that kind of niche community in this, um, you know, in, in making these nonfiction comics. So I hope that, um, some of you will join the course. We already have quite a few signups so far in both of the classes. So um, I'm looking forward to teaching both again this semester and then the, the new class starting the semester. All right, I think that's all. So I will stop sharing my screen and then back to Pan. All right, back to me. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for making it to the end of all of our presentations. Now we can address um, all of these great questions that um, I can't actually see because I was, since my Zoom crashed. Oh, I, I can help you with that. Um, well, I can so. initially address, it uh, looks like Emily, um, who has been very active in the chat, just dropped about six questions. So <laughs> um, so just to start us off and then, and then we'll kind of go back and ex try to excavate some of the previous ones. Um, that you all asked earlier in the session. So the first one is any chance you, if you sign up for an uh, in-class course, it will be canceled. Um, you know, that's the kind of the questions around the, the Omicron, the situation with COVID in New York. Um, what I, you know, that's, that's a lot of that's kind of out of our control. And, you know, it's, I, it's you know, no anyone who's gonna make predictions these days, even a few weeks in advance, um, you know, that, that's kind of a fool's game. I would say that, um, I, I will say that the school, uh, because our undergraduate program started this, this week, um, the school basically uh, made the decision to have the first two weeks of BFA classes online. 
um, and our vaccine mandate uh, for the SVA community has expanded to include booster shots. So by the time we're back in person, um, which will be in two weeks, everyone, um, in order to be able to gain access to the campus, they'll have to have two shots plus a booster um, if they're eligible. So that's that's number one. And then continuing education classes start a week after that. So, you know, based on, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not, you know, I'm not part of the, you know, I lack any, I don't have any more credentials than any guests who are here tonight, but based on, you know, based on what seems to be happening, I, th I think it's, I think it's fair to say the classes will start on time uh, in about, I'd say three weeks from three weeks from now, that's when CE classes are supposed to start. Um, maximum number of pages a resozine can be, um, that really depends on the binding. You know, I mean, it, if you're just doing a simple centerfold pamphlet uh, bound zine where there's staples or it's sewn in the middle, I, I wouldn't go above something like 13 pages, which is still a lot of pages, but going beyond that, then it starts to become a book, multiple signatures. So that can get up to about 50 pages or so. Um, the cover of a Rizzo zine, uh, you know, some of these are aesthetic questions. And if you take either the zine class or Aiden's class or the mini comic class, the decisions about what content is in the inside the zine versus the cover, you know, that's something that's sort of like, it depends on the project and your own personal choice. Um, what stage of an art piece do you need uh, to plan for it to be Rizzo printed? Um, the thing about printing, and I think what's really great about printing in this day and age and in 2022, um, is that you really have to commit to it. So if, you know, if you have an idea and you, you know, if you, you want to make a PDF, you can always go back and edit it later on. With digital media, you put up a website, you can take it down, you can edit it. You know, you publish something online, but it, you know, you can pull the plug immediately. When you print something, you're committing time and resources. You have to think hard about, is this, uh, is this sort of, do I want this to exist? Is it, is it worthwhile to commit to, to use the paper, to use the time, um, to use the inks um, to, to kind of make this project? Um, you know, and, and that's, that's, I think it puts the onus on you to, to kind of prove that. So that's, that's why it's, um, you know, you kind of have to take, uh, you have to take that leap um, and commit to it. The price, um, different binding techniques. So all of the, all of this, all these technical details, we go over this class. Um, the thing about Rizzo printing is it is incredibly affordable, um, especially compared to the quality that you get, which is why, uh, which is really why it's exploded as the perfect medium for those who want to make an, an edition of prints or publications that are, you know, that sort of go between about 50 copies and about a thousand copies. About a thousand is sort of, that's where it becomes a bit um, unwieldy. And then you get into, the production gets a little bit ridiculous. Um, but between 100 and, between 50 and 500 is about the sweet spot for Rizzo. Um, at, that, at that amount, it becomes very, very expensive to print an edition like that per unit if you're gonna do an offset. Um, you know, offset printing can be very cheap um, per unit, but you have to print thousands of copies. Um, and then if you're doing with traditional means with, you know, a hand printed artist book, it becomes very expensive because that's a lot of physical labor for printing, um, hand printing an entire book. So that's, that's why I think Rizzo, um, it's very cost effective. It's very time effective, especially if you have binding tools and things that we're looking to add in the future, like folding machines and different binding machines. Right now we're all based on hand binding at the Rizzo lab, but it's a great place to prototype a project, um, which then you can maybe print as a bigger addition with offset printing, et cetera. In terms of your follow-up question, Emily, about uh, if a class is canceled, of course, uh, you know, of course, if a class is canceled, you'd be refunded um, if, it's, if it's for a reason that's out of your control. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that if, uh, if there's any concern that the schedule might change. We would make um, every chance, we would take every, uh, you know, the, the, the college would definitely try to make sure everyone gets, gets credit, um, if not a full refund for, um, for what In addition, um, most of these classes have been taught online before. And if we had to switch over, you know, that could be an option. Not, not all of them, but many of them are already developed for online. We hope not. We hope it's all, all the ones that are intended on campus. We're, we're rallying. We hope so. 
Um, let me go back to another chat question. Uh, Leah asked how much Adobe Suite experience do you need to take these classes? Um, uh, well, at least for my class, I have it set up so that you could have pretty much no experience. But if you if you have no experience, but you have a basic, if you, you I think what's helpful is to have a visual art practice. Um, so if you're coming to the class without a visual art practice and without any Photoshop experience, there might be a bit of a learning curve. But the ways that we use the Adobe Suite programs in my class um, are, you know, you may you may be very well versed in Photoshop or Illustrator as a designer or as a creative professional that uses them, or you know, a hobbyist that uses them in a certain way. But the way that we use these programs for to prepare files for ResearchGraph printing, you know, you might be kind of using them in a way that you've never have before, and in a very simple, intuitive way. So, um, in some senses, if people don't have experience preparing print files, they're all starting at the same place. Um, so that's what I, that, that's for my classes. And I think that, uh, you know, the other instructors can speak to their, like Ren, you know, if Ren, Aiden, and- Yeah. Yeah, Ren, I, yeah. I, I can chime in just about my class. So um, I also set it up where you don't need any Photoshop experience. I start from like the very beginning um, with the stuff that we do cover within Photoshop. It does help. Um, because, you know, Photoshop is hard and is confusing, but I do make sure that you don't need any prior Photoshop experience. Um, and I also saw a question uh, from during my time uh, that was asking, do the comics need to be drawn all digitally? Uh, and that's also no. Um, we print from Photoshop in my class, but you can actually draw and create the comics any way you want to. So you can uh, make them traditionally pen on paper, paint on paper, um, or you can use, uh, you know, whatever uh, image making software that you choose, whether that be Photoshop, Clip Studio, Procreate. Um, and what we end up doing is just either scanning that in or importing it into Photoshop uh, when we're ready to print. Um, and I do want to mention to, uh, in case anyone doesn't know that while you're enrolled in these classes, you do have access to Creative Suite uh, for the uh, semester, so. Yeah, I was gonna, gonna say the same thing, which is basically that I kind of orient my class to sort of be a primer on like Photoshop and the Creative Suite, um, and also a sort of, like Pam was saying, the way that we set up files for Resograph printing is, very specific. So even if you do have Photoshop or Adobe experience, which is great, uh, you'll still be learning this new process. Um, so everybody is kind of learning. If you, uh, at least for my class, I have a couple of like just Photoshop tutorials that I've done. I've recorded like separately for the students to be able to access because uh, I've had a couple students that have basically learned Photoshop through the class. Um, and, you know, Ren was saying that his, the Rezo process and file setup has sort of like influenced the way he sets up files for other uh, illustrations, other, other gigs. And that is, I've, I've found that true as well. Like learning Adobe through printing on a Rezo, well, you can apply a lot of this, uh, this knowledge and this sort of workflow in Adobe. You can use that in a lot of different other uh, projects. So it, it's a great opportunity to learn um, the creative suite uh, with a purpose. Thanks, guys. Um, Joan, are there any questions that you can excavate from earlier in the chat that I can't I can't see? If you want to dig one up. Oh, I guess I just see a question in the chat about Midnight Gospel. I just drew backgrounds on the show. Um, other questions are, Lewis asked, can Rezo be incorporated into a film process? Um, that's a really interesting question because I actually had two students in my undergrad class last semester that both made for their final project for my four credit class. Uh, instead of making a zine, which is the default assignment, they made um, Rezo animations. So they, act, they created animations digitally with, I think with a combination of digital and analog processes, but separately, 
Um, and then they printed out print sheets with all the frames printed at about one inch by two inch uh, frames, then scanned them each individually, lined them up, and then created a looping animation. So they, they were able to bring in all of the imperfections of this kind of funky process, all of the, especially the texture, because those frames were so small that when they scanned them and they blew them up, you could see the halftone dots, you could see the slight misregistration, the way the colors blended. And that is actually a um, very innovative and growing way for designers to use Rezo. It's, it's kind of like a very, uh, it's, it's sort of, I feel like it's, uh, it's about to explode um, in terms of something that young artists and designers want to use the process for. So it's, um, if you want to check that out, we, I posted both of those animations to the Rezo Lab Instagram at the end of the year last year towards uh, kind of late December. So go ahead to Instagram. Our handle is just at Rezo Lab and you can find those there. They're both, they're both very different. They're both, they're both amazing. So. Mm. I would also uh, just jump in and add that like, <clears throat> again, as a student, like um, way back when I was a undergrad uh, film student, we learned on like Steenbeck hand cutting 16 millimeter film and splicing it together. Um, and I found then when we moved to doing Final Cut and the digital version of that, there was an ingrained like knowledge of where that came from theoretically, what it was based on. And I find that working with the risograph, like, or at least learning how to use it for our purposes, like informs your knowledge of Photoshop in a similar way, like what these layers or basically the way the programs are set up, like what's that based on? And it's more often than not physical technology and having an application like this, like just helps you understand the idea behind those programs a little bit better and then how to use them comes more naturally. Hmm. Why don't we see if there's any questions for non rezo for a couple of minutes and then we'll go back to rezo questions because there's lots of those. Any Anybody got questions for Su Suzanne or Sarah or Bob while, while we're still all on? Okay. Um, so one of the other questions was, um, let's see, would taking the intro class and the zine class be redundant? Uh, you mentioned that you learn the same things, but the zines are focused on publications, or is there benefit in taking both, or should you take one or the other? Um, well, I mean, since I'll, I'll take this since those I teach both of those classes. Um, yeah, I mean, they're all set up as, you know, there's no prerequisite for either class. Um, but I guess it, it, it speaks to what your initial burning interest is. Do you want to understand the medium first and be more open to, um, to make just a, a suite of prints and just experiment and uh, maybe, you know, maybe make sculptures combining print um, with whatever sculpture practice you have or painting, um, or are you, do you know that you definitely wanna make a publication? In which case, the zine class, we, the zine class and the intro class diverge pretty quickly. Um, you know, the, we go over different formats. Um, I have a few different templates that I provide. Um, and I also show a lot of zines and I talk about zines and I have a, I have a, uh, a talk I give that connects it to, to print history. Um, and I, I have had a number of students that have taken both classes. They take the intro class and then they take the zine class. And there is some overlap, but I think for them, it's just they have appreciated having more time in the class to troubleshoot. And then, you know, the class is sort of different every time I teach it in a way. So, and it's gonna be a different group of students. You might um, interact with different people. Um, after you take a class, you can you could also pay a lab fee and be in the lab and using the facilities. Um, you know, without, without kind of being in a class. So you just book time outside of class. So that's also an option. Um, I think the biggest difference, uh, if you were gonna jump around and take different classes, it would be worthwhile, and a number of students have done this as well, to take a class with me, and then maybe take a class with Ren or Aiden, because each of us has 
you know, as, as people who've been using this medium since before it was as widely known, um, relatively widely known as it is, um, we each figured out our own way to, to, to make it work for us. So each of us is gonna teach the medium in a different way. So I think that's the biggest difference is that, you know, you get, you get Aiden instead of Ren. And then how does Aiden, what are the, the subtle differences in the approach? We're each gonna have something to share that you won't get in the other class. So um, yeah, that, that's hopefully that gives you some kind of, a, some kind of guidance on that. Um, Gerilyn asked whether the same classes are offered in the fall. Uh, generally speaking, yes. I mean, sometimes we have a new class or sometimes a teacher may not be available, but generally, yes. Also in the summer, mm -hmm. in addition to the fall. So it's pretty much year round. Um, let me think. Is there a summer session intro to Rizzo in person? Yes. So yes, right now we're, <laughs> we're trying. Um, and uh, going back, um, Raynard, what is the average cost for a 16 to 24 page zine in an addition of 54 by eight inches? Well, that sounds, I mean, that's getting into technicals and, and it yeah. sort of it depends on the printer, it depends on the, uh, you know, with, if you take a class, you're, you're just paying for the class and the paper, basically. So we, the, the prints, the masters, every time you make a separate color layer, um, the machine cuts a, a length of master paper, which is basically like a paper stencil and it digitally burns away your image in the exact shape that creates like basically an opening for the ink to pass through and get pushed onto the paper. Um, that's what we refer to when you say masters. So your masters, your inks, your, your prints, all of that is covered, it's a flat rate. So you're really just paying for the class and paying for whatever you want to print on, basically. Um, but if you if you were to commission that, if you were going to hire a Rezo printer, you know it's all over the place. Um, and I've done free, you know, I've done contract printing in the past. I know Aiden has. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if Ren has done a lot of printing for hire, but different printers will give you different rates. But uh, but we that's not what we're in the business of doing at the lab. We're in the business of giving you the skill so you can print it yourself. So, but I, I will say it, even whether you hire someone or whether you do it yourself, it's gonna be cheap. Mm -hmm. um, Rezo machines are extremely temperamental. <laughs> I was just gonna say, good question. Very yeah. moody. That's why we have technicians all the time yeah. to work with you because um, they're a little bit finicky and we don't wanna leave you on your own in the best way, in the, in the best, like Star Wars droids, like the cutest possible, most enduring <laughs> way. Yeah, unfortunately also we have four machines in the studio. So like if one isn't working for the day, you know, there's still other opportunities to print whatever you're working on. Um, anyone else have questions that we didn't get to? I feel like we've addressed everything. Last, last questions all around. <clears throat> anyway, uh, registrations open. Classes start as early as a couple of weeks from now or maybe three weeks from now towards the end of January. Uh, but there are various uh, increments depending which class you look at. Um, but we encourage you to sign up as soon as you can. Um, and Pan, what else, did you have anything else to add? Oh, I was just going to say there. I think there was a question about the difference between inkjet and oh, mm -hmm. Rezo. Um, so the difference between Rezo and inkjet and most most kinds of printing that you might be familiar with is that you actually have to get involved in the process yourself. So an inkjet printer is going to take your image, and the that between the algorithm between the the printer. Uh, software and the printer itself, it's going to translate your full color image with all of your brilliant colors into just a blend of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So that's why when you take your beautiful piece of digital art and you send it to your Epson, you get this muddy sort of soggy piece of paper that just looks 
like a pile of mud, you know, doesn't have anything to do, doesn't have any relation to the image you saw on your screen. With Rizzo, you have to design your piece layer by layer. So you're getting involved in the process. It's more like traditional printing. Um, so that's, if that, and you know, and, and I know it seemed, might seem kind of abstract, um, but it, it, learning how to design files for Rizzo, um, especially the way that we teach it at the Rizzo Lab, will make you understand all other forms of printing and not take it for granted. Like you'll, you'll know why something doesn't look right. You'll say, oh, the yellow, the yellow plate on that CMYK poster was too strong. So that's why all the reds look kind of orange, you know, or you'll notice so you'll, you'll be reading the, you'll, you'll take a look at a newspaper, you'll see, wow, the cyan, you'll start to see the different layers. You'll start to see halftones. It's, um, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, you come to the Rizzo lab and you take the print blue pill and then you can never look at a subway poster. No, is it the red pill? I forget now. Um, I think it's the red pill, right? Yeah, Careful. you take the red pill. And Nobody's gonna get red pills. We don't wanna. <laughs> you see, you see half tones ever, just in terms of print, just in terms of print. Right? Oh, okay. Um, anyway, it's neutral. It's, it's apolitical, no political associations. <laughs> um, but, uh, but at any rate, um, that's, you know, that, hopefully that will give you an idea. And then obviously we go deeper into that in the classes, so. Now someone's, uh, Bucky is asking to you, I guess, Pan to just expand a little bit more on the difference between intro and the zine, zine class. Um, well, so if you are interested in, um, moving into chapbooks, zines, and movie posters. Well, chapbooks and zines sound like, you know, you're interested in making publications and multiples. So I think in that case, the zine class would obviously make more sense. Um, there are some binding techniques that I know I don't really touch on as much in the intro class, um, because then it would just, we could just have one class and not have a specialized class. So uh, yeah, so the zine class seems like it would make more sense for you. Um, the, the Rizzo lab we have, we have open hours. We're open generally from about 10 to six, most weekdays. Um, we're open Friday evenings and weekends as well. Um, weeknights were where you have classes, uh, you know, Monday through Thursday. So most weeknights, um, we have to switch over to having class time after about six o'clock, six thirty. Um, but you do have access to the lab with, if you join the class, you can come back, you can either book time on a machine or you can just show up and use like the paper cutters and um, you don't have to reserve time just to use some of our other facilities, so. Yeah, and then any, once you've taken a class, you, I think we touched on this, but it's an important uh, advantage. You can sign up for an open access and for a flat fee for the whole next semester period, you can book time online and just come and print anytime you want. So, yeah, and I just like to mention one thing too. If you're um, wanting to sign up for a class, don't wait till the last minute be because you have to get like your vaccines approved and everything. Um, registration for classes uh, closes one week before the class actually begins. So sign up today. Oh. <laughs> yes, good point. Because if at that point, if there aren't enough people, they will look to cancel the class. So we don't want that to happen, do we? So Sign up. Anything else we can help you guys with? Is there a minimum maximum for each class? Yes, uh, I believe the minimum is seven. Maximum is as per the faculty member, usually 12 to 20 in there, depending, but each person sets their own maximum. 15 for the Rizzo Lab generally. Yeah, mostly to make sure everybody has access to what they need. All right, thanks for staying on so late, everybody. Is there any, any last questions before we wrap up? Uh, what's the difference between the red pill and the blue? I'm sorry, <laughs> I couldn't resist. Thank you guys so much for, for staying on this late. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, guys. I'll be sending a follow-up email with links to registration and also to this recording that we're going to be posting on uh, our website. So thank you all, and hopefully we'll see some of you in class in person or online um, in a few weeks. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.